So now let's quickly touch base with what is Hive. So we are there in our module number 7. We are going to talk about Hive. At a very high level, we will see what is Hive. So if you want to work with SQL, you saw PIG is a data flow scripting language. Similarly, Hive is SQL based language, friend. Okay? So that is what is crucial. Let's see the differences between PIG and Hive. Look at the Hive architecture and the components, limitations of Hive, how to work with different types in Hive, data model operations, and execute Hive scripts and Hive UDF. This is what we're going to see in this course, in this module. So let me give you a quick backdrop. <clears throat> Everything started in Hive from Facebook. It was in 2009 when Jeff Hammerbash was the CTO of Facebook, and he had a lot of uh, data. Problems. Data in those days was connected, was co collected via nightly cron jobs, and it was put into an Oracle DB. ETL was definitely done through hand-coded Python, and he, he had the data size growing from tens of gigs uh, uh, in 2006 to one terabyte per day in 2007 to 10 terabyte in 2009. So he definitely knew that he's having a big data problem. So volume aspects, so he said, okay, let's go ahead and see what Yahoo and other people are doing it. They are working on Hadoop. The challenge was that uh, working on MapReduce. That requires Java programmers. He did not have enough of Java programmers. So that's why he developed about 12 uh, Java developers and created a framework called as Hive. So they wrote uh, for every SQL code, they had a template which will convert that into a MapReduce code and it would work. Sim just similar to your pig, every SQL code will get converted into a MapReduce code and that is what is the background of Hive, folks. Okay? So that is what is the uh, base way. <coughs> Make sense? So Yusuf was saying, I had enough of uh, coding in Google Analytics and uh, Google uh, Tag Manager plugin. Can you give me a hint where I can put in, uh, put in Hive, uh, pig and Hive in between? So any time when you want to do any semi-structured data, you'll have to do pig and structured data in Hive. Okay? There's a thumb rule that you'll have to follow. So, uh, what was the challenge with Facebook was that they had 950 million users, they had 500 terabyte of data all day, more than 70,000 queries, and more than 300 million photos that was getting uploaded. So, this is where the challenge was. So, of course, they can't use your traditional RDBMS. The solution was they can go for MapReduce, but the challenge was that it was hard to program because it was Java-based, and uh, uh, they had people who know SQL very well. So that's why they started. They developed a project called as Hive. In Hive, table can be partitioned and bucketed. I'll explain that to you. Schema flexibility and evolution is there so that at runtime you can create a schema. Remember, schema on read. You can plug in custom mapper and uh, driver code. The JDBC, ODBC drivers are readily available. You can define Hive tables directly on data and HDFS, and it is extensible with creating a custom type formats and functions, etc. So that is how Hive helped Facebook in uh, their analysis work. And if you look at the market, most of our data is still structured data. So you would see how being used for more than 60 to 65 percent of your projects right now, then PIG and then MapReduce. Okay? So this is the base, guys. So let's summarize it with this site. So what is Hive? And, and guys, I would want you to read the Hive chapter from the definitive guide, please. Next week, by next week, you would need it. So for non-Java guys, please read uh, the advanced map reduce slides and the topics what I've said and read the Hive chapter from the definitive guide. It's only about 25 pages or 30 pages. You have got this whole week, guys. And of course, practice on PIG also. So what is Hive? It's a data warehousing package built on top of Hadoop or used for data analysis. Helpful for people who are familiar with SQL. Language is called a SQL and Hive QL. And if you look at the definitive guide, he's got a table wherein he compares SQL and Hive QL. And then he has got a link, uh, a hyperlink, which will take you to the exact page where the comparison is. So please refer to that table. It is must.
It is for managing and curing only structured data. Of course, the complete complexity of Hadoop is gone. You good thing is you don't have to learn Java or Hadoop APIs developed by Facebook are analyzing several terabytes of data every day using Hive. <clears throat> nice. So that is about Hive. Let's move on. So just to again quickly understand what is Hive, it defines SQL-like query language called as HiveQL. It is a data warehousing infrastructure, so you put in data from multiple different sources into Hive and then you talk about analysis. It provides tools to provide uh, to enable easy data ETL, that is extract, transform, load, transformations, etc. can be easily done in Hive. And of course, it allows programmers to plug in their custom mappers and reducers also. So we will see how to work with the Python code also. So this is in short what is Hive. So now I would want you to go down and uh, open up a document that I already have it in the uh, copy link. So let me quickly go down to Edureka and if you look at Hive and not this, <clears throat> there will be a folder called as Hive Advanced Codes and there is a file called as practicals.txt. This has got a lot of queries that uh, we will be working with as to how, 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 as to how Hive works. So let me <clears throat> double click on practicals.txt. So this is how it is. This is the way how we will play around with syntax. So let me go back and check if my VM is ready. Yep, my VM is ready. Let me log into it so that I can put in my password. Oops, what's happening? I can't type my password. Okay, there it is. So while it loads up, let's go ahead with a little bit more of theory. So where do I use Hive? Wherever you want to do data mining, so specifically Hive has got a capability called as bucketing. That is the place where we use it a lot for data mining. Hive can be used for various types of document indexing, uh, predictive modeling, hypothesis testing. But please remember Hive is primarily for reporting. It is not a replacement for your analytical tools. So analytical tools like R and SAS and all those things are for analytics, algorithms, Mahout, etc. Right? Hive is good for customer BI. To some extent, Hive can be used in log processing, but then primarily semi-structured data is done through big folks. So these are the areas where I can use Hive. So now the question comes, we have already done PIG. Okay, so what is the difference between Hive and PIG? I do have a list of do's and don'ts for Hive programming based on your experience, which, may, which you might have come across multiple scenarios. Uh, a thumb rule, uh, Nandish, to let you know is uh, uh, whatever is the best practices what we have been following in your uh, PLSQL world, you, those are the best practices that we follow over here. Other than that, it is not much. So if you are looking at your analytics, then go for bucketing. So partitioning, bucketing, external tables, those are all the do's that I would suggest. Don'ts as such there is no because uh, <coughs> you, would, you would want to utilize the capabilities of Hive to the fullest. So look at what are the capabilities that is there in Hive and simply don't go about creating user-defined functions. So that is a unnecessary overhead that you would have. So that is in a short nutshell, uh, Nandish. So now when we talk about uh, PIG, uh, PIG is primarily a data flow language. That means you declare a variable and uh, you load data into that particular variable and then you dump it. Whereas Hive is primarily a SQLish kind of language. So you use your SQL and say select star from so and so. That is what is Hive. PIG is primarily used by uh, researchers and uh, programmers. That means it is primarily used for ad hoc analysis. Okay, So for semi-structured data, the, the use of PIG is very good. Whereas Hive in general is used by your data or by your business analyst who will be doing reporting, etc. So reporting and all of those things are typically going to be done in Hive. So when we talk about talent, when we talk about Pentaho, so they have got ready-made connectors to Hive. <coughs> so that's what it is, guys. 
So this is the reason why you would want to go for Hive when you already have got Pig. <coughs> so now an exhaustive list of uh, comparison between Hive and Pig. So uh, we have got uh, multiple uh, points on which you will typically be doing the comparison. So we have got 12 points. So what is Hive? Hive is SQL-like language, whereas Pig is uh, like scripting-like language, and the language is called as Pig Latin. In Hive, you will have explicit schemas. You'll create a table, because without a table, I cannot do anything in Hive. Whereas in Pig, there is an implicit schema. You say, uh, load something as. So you're going to give some uh, variable, and then you will look at that. So it is an implicit schema. There is no explicit schema as such. OK? Then when we talk about partitions, Yes, you will specifically have partitions like a normal RDBMS over here. I'm sure Vijay would know based on what he had mentioned. Uh, you will go for horizontal partitioning over here, whereas PIG, we don't have any concept. Uh, uh, sorry, let me go to the next page. By mistake, I did a page up. So in uh, your uh, PIG, there is nothing called as partitioning <coughs> in a normal thing. Then when we talk about a server, Hive has got a thrift server, and that is the way how you will be able to communicate from external components to Hive, whereas PIG does not have anything as a server. Then the uh, next two things are there in both Hive and PEG. You can, of course, create your own user-defined functions using Java and other languages. You have got a custom serializer, deserializer in both of them. That is what is Avro. Okay, serialization, deserialization. Then when we talk about the direct access to DFS, in Hive, until now, uh, sorry, in PIG, you have seen that we are specifically using files. So there is an explicit access to HDFS, whereas in Hive, you will see that we will not always talk about the file. We will talk about a table, because a table is what is associated with the file, so that is, that is how it is. Okay, so we will always work with a table and not with a file. What is Thrift? Thrift is a language independent kind of thing that was developed by Yahoo. Oh, sorry, that was developed by Facebook. Okay, uh, like if you know about uh, what is Corba, Common Object Request Broker Architecture, something similar to that. So uh, just go for Apache Thrift. So there we go. So see here, it's a framework for scalable cross-language uh, service development and uh, deployment. So click on this. This will give you a very good idea about what is Thrift. So see over here, uh, you can write any of these languages. OK, and uh, uh, Thrift allows you to define data types and service interface in a simple uh, language independent way of doing it. Okay, so that is what is uh, your Apache Thrift. So now, when we talk about join, order, sort, shell uh, programming, and streaming access, all the three, uh, I mean, for all these three points, both the technologies have got access. When we talk about a web interface, uh, Hive has got something called as uh, Hive Web Interface, HWI. OK, high web interface, whereas PIC does not have anything of that sort. And for JDBC, ODBC, there is a limited access to in Hive, whereas you don't have an access in PIC. So this is an exhaustive list of uh, details as to, uh, to show how there is a comparison between Hive and PIC, guys. OK? So now let's look at the architecture. So this is what is something that would be important for you to understand. So now. If you look at the architecture, please understand this. So what is Hive? Hive is a layer that is above Hadoop, which allows people to use uh, SQL-based uh, data access uh, technique for analyzing data in HDFS. So you will have your Karma Sphere hue. And see, Prasanna, we have got Kubel also over here. OK, so we will have multiple different techniques how you will be able to connect through uh, the Hive layer. The most commonly used is Hue, that is Hadoop user experience. 
then uh, uh, they will be connecting to Hive. So either they will be connecting through a Thrift application or they will be connecting through a JDBC or DBC application. Of course, there would be a uh, client which will directly talk to the Thrift server if it is a Thrift, or else via J Hive, JDBC, ODBC driver, <coughs> they will connect to the data whatever is there in Hive. So you will have a driver in Hive which compiles, optimizes, and executes the code. Of course, there has to be a meta store over here. So the meta store is a place where the schema is stored. So, so something fundamental that you'll have to understand, folks, is uh, the difference between a meta store and and uh, HDFS. The actual data is there in your HDFS, whereas the schema is there in meta store. So uh, by default, uh, either you can use use uh, uh, MySQL or else you can use your Derby as a schema. So in the VM what we are given, we are using MySQL as a schema where the Metastore will be stored. And of course you will have a command line interface and a high web interface through which you can connect to the data in your HDFS. So this is how the layering happens, folks. The interaction between third party applications, connecting to Hive and then talking to JDBC. Is Kubol or uh, Hue a web interface to connect to Hive, in which case we can use them? Hey, this is all third-party components from where you can connect to Hive. So what am I trying to show? You could, I could put over here on the top uh, Cognos, I can put MicroStrategy, I can put Tableau. Anybody who wants to access to Hive, they can do it through a JDBC or DBC bridge. So what am I showing? You will have third-party applications who wants to connect to the data that is there in your Hive. You can do that. So you can even connect your MS Office to your uh, Hive, provided you have got Microsoft HD inside. So HD inside is a way how you can have Hadoop on Windows. Okay, so whatever might be the third party tool, they will all connect to Hive via Thrift, JDBC or ODBC. There will be a meta store where the schema is going to be there. All of them will connect to the schema and the schema will actually point to the data. Okay, I'm actually going to show a demo so that it will become very clear. The met okay, Nandish was saying, is the meta store will be there in the name node? No, the meta store will be there on the client side. Whoever is going to communicate, the meta store will be available over there because the schema is there with him, right? The actual data is there. So the meta store will actually be there in the database. If you talk about MySQL, so let's say all of us wants to connect to the data in Hadoop. Assume on my machine I have got Hadoop. So how are you going to talk to Hive? One, you can talk to Hive using command line interface. So I don't need any of these guys, any of things. You can connect to Hive using a Hive web interface. Again, I don't need any of these things. But in case if you're connecting through any of the external uh, components, they will connect via Thrift, JDBC, or ODBC to the Metastore, and that Metastore will communicate with your Hadoop. That is how the architecture is. OK? Let me go ahead with a demo. The demo will make half of these doubts clear. So if you can just park your question for two, three minutes, and let me go ahead and show you an actual example so that it becomes very, very, very clear to everybody. Let me open up my terminal window. And let me say sudo JPS just to ensure that all of my services are up and running because for some reason nowadays I'm having some issues. Yeah, good. My name node, my data node, node manager, resource manager is up. So everything is up and running for me. So I don't have any issues. So what am I going to do? Like last time, I'm going to start with my putty. I, I don't like working with over here. IF config. My IP over here. Uh, see, I always get this number lock on and off. That's irritating. 192.168.235.131. So let me go down to my party, and I will work with it. Just give me one sec, folks. 135.131, let me load my VM. And the username is edureka, password is edureka. Wait, guys, I'm going to increase the font, etc. I'll do everything for you. Change settings. Go down to appearance. Go down to change the font. And come on, come on, come on. It is giving me a hover glass. There we go. So 16 should be good enough. Let me go down to my colors. My foreground is going to be black. And my background is going to be white. 
let me say OK and let me say apply. So let's continue. So here we are. So how do we start with Hive, friends? Hive is already installed for us. So I will just type Hive and press enter and you would see that uh, I will be getting into the Hive shell. Okay. So by default, I have got a, a SQL database where my Hive is getting connected to. Let me show that to you also. So Hive, come on. I don't know why it's taking time. Yeah, there we go. It is getting connected to Hive. See, USR Lib Hive is the place where I have got my uh, Hive installed. Okay, while well, this fellow is coming up, let me quickly go down to the VM and I wanted to show you something. Let me go down to my places, go down to my home folder and uh, let me go down to my file system. Let me go down to my USR, lib and in lib it will take some time because there's a lot of files what we have in lib. I'm going to start with Hive, couple of seconds folks. It's giving me hover glass, so let it get loaded. After that, we will get down to the high folder. Okay, so let me go down to the high folder. Let me scroll down. Yeah, high 13. I'll go down to conf, and in conf, uh, I should have <coughs> a file. This is the default template. Where is my? Uh, hive.xml, let me go down to conf again, <coughs> let me edit this file, the default xml file, come on, why can't I right click on it, just one sec, this is pretty irritating, okay, there we go, I'm opening that file with a gedit, <clears throat> let me maximize that. So let me scroll down. So there has to be a place where I will be giving the connection URL, etc. That's what I wanted to show you. <clears throat> this is what links Hive to where my data is. Man, the number of properties have increased drastically. <clears throat> Okay, let me go down. Earlier it was a couple of them. Let me do a control F and I'll do connection. There we go. <coughs> okay, so this is the connection URL hope. Let me go down Metastore, MinThread, a lot about Thrift and Kerberos, etc. <coughs> let me do a uh, control F once again. Let me see if there is one more connection here. Yeah, there is one more connections. Let me go down to the find next. <coughs> there we go. <coughs> okay. See over here, guys. This is the uh, place where we are specifying our connection. So we are saying uh, what is the connection string by default. <clears throat> See, this is the JDBC driver that is going to be used. So by default, it is going to use a embedded JDBC driver. <clears throat> and uh, this is what is the connection string. It will create the database, etc. If you want to connect to MySQL, you can easily do that. Uh, Archana has got a very good block of hers. So let me go, go down and search for uh, Hive on MySQL. <clears throat> so I know her personally. So there it is, Archana Changle. So she has got a very good uh, blog which will tell me how you can connect it to a, a MySQL. There we go. Control C. Just give me one sec. Control A, Control C. Hey, I haven't started with my <coughs> file today. Let me go ahead and say save. Let me go down to customers, Edureka. Let me go down to Feb 21st. And this is going to be our day seven. <clears throat> yeah, I should have saved it as day seven.txt. Just one sec. 
So day seven is always painful. If I don't give it an extension, dot text, there we go. And this is that link. Okay, cool. Let me minimize that. So uh, by default, it is going to be, so I just showed you how you can connect to MySQL, but then this was just to let you know how you can change the parameters. Okay, you will have to uh, create a hive hyphen site.xml and that will have all the values. Cool. Let me go ahead and quit this and let me minimize this so that we can start. <clears throat> so now, if I go back to Hive over here, and if I say show databases, okay, it'll show me the list of databases what I'm having. So you see here, I already have a database called as Retail, Edureka, Subrat, okay? So I'm having four databases. By default, when you do this, you will see that there is only one database called as default, okay? So show databases is a command which will give me the database. So it is like MySQL syntax. So because it's again open source, so it will give you the list of databases what you're having. Okay. So now <coughs> please understand this, the mapping. Okay. So between Hive and HDFS, how the mapping happens. One, <coughs> a database in Hive is mapped to a folder in HDFS and the location of the folder will be user warehouse uh, sorry user hive <coughs> warehouse and the name of the database dot db so this is what is the mapping going to be then a table in your hive is mapped to a folder within the database folder the rows in Hive is mapped to mapped as files within the table folder. This is what is the crux, guys. Okay? So you should be very clear on this as to how the mapping happens between Hive and HDFS. So uh, now if I want to actually see that file, I should be able to see it over here. So let me go back to my VM. And if I go to my browser, let the browser come up and once the browser comes up if I go down to my name node status and if I go down to my browse the file system and if I go down to my user and if I go down to my hive you will see a folder called as warehouse, whereas you should not see this folder because you haven't worked with Hive until now. You will not see this folder called as warehouse. <clears throat> Inside warehouse, you will see the two databases that I created that is called as retail and subreddit. <clears throat> yeah, in the Edureka VM, you will also see uh, your Edureka database also. So the default in Edureka is what you will see because now I remember Edureka has created a database themselves. Okay, but these are the new databases that I have created and you will actually see that. Okay, and then <clears throat> when I go inside retail, I should see the tables associated with those things. Okay. So now what am I going to do is, because I'll run out of memory space, so I'm just going to do some housekeeping. Please give, bear with me. I'll say drop database retail. Okay, so I'll say use retail. Just give me one sec, guys. Show tables. And I'll say drop table txn records. <coughs> because I want, I'm, I'm doing, I'm on a cleaning session over here. Okay, then I will say uh, drop, so I will say use uh, subret, I will say show tables, I will say drop table txn records, because everything is nothing but more of memory, right? Then I will say drop table txn recs by cat. <coughs> Then I will say use default and I will say drop database retail and then I will say drop database subrat. This is my earlier batch students and all that. Okay, now if I say show databases, 
I'll have only two. This is exactly like what uh, you guys are saying. So now, if you go back to the document that I had called as practicals.txt, which is there in your uh, copy link, if you have downloaded it. So uh, let me show that link to you once again. So if you go down to your, wherever you have extracted that copy to a folder called as Hive Advanced Codes, there is a file called as practicals.txt, which will have customers and transactions, and uh, that is the file that I'm referring to over here. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a retail database. So first step, let me create a database called as retail. And I don't want to use retail, I want to use Arvind. Okay, let's say Kirti. So I'm going to say create database Kirti. Now, <clears throat> see, the database got created. And now if I say show databases, you will see that the database called as Kirti is here. So this is the schema that I'm seeing, guys. I hope you're understanding, right? This is the schema that I'm seeing. Okay, and where will this actually be mapped to? Now, if I go back to the user hive warehouse, and if I click on the warehouse directory, you will see earlier I was seeing something else. Now, since I dropped it, I don't see it. I will see something called as kirti.db. Okay, so edureka db is not in this folder. Okay, they have created this edureka db, and what they have done is they have created that at the edureka over here. User edureka is where they have kept it. Okay, that comes by default. They have kept it over there. So we will have to use our stuff. So we will use it the way how we have it. So if I go down to my, where is my user? Just give me one sec. There it is. I go to my user. I go to my hive. I go to my warehouse and I will see something called as kirti.db. Why are you not seeing edureka and default is because default is mapped to the warehouse directory. Okay? If you don't say anything, okay, by default it is mapped to the warehouse directory and anything that table that you create in the default database, it will directly go inside the warehouse directory. Edureka is a simple database what edureka is created for testing the hive and that is what it is. Okay, is this folders.db also use the same policy of replication as an HDFS? Hey, these are folders, yeah, true. So, whatever is there in your HDFS, okay, these folders are in HDFS, right? So anything that is there in HDFS will have the same replication policy. So, if you are able to create a database, can you go down to the browser, you should be able to see it here. So, let's move on, guys. So, what did I show you right now? I just showed you how to create a table. So, sorry, database. So, a database is mapped to what? A database is mapped to a folder in the file system. So, if I go down to the folder, inside the folder, I will not see anything. Okay? Why? Because I haven't created a table inside it. Got it, guys? So, let's minimize. And uh, now, <coughs> let me go back to the document. You will have to say, use the database so that you are going to go inside the database. And we are going to create a table. Okay, so let's go ahead and say use Kirti so that I am inside the database. Now, you might wonder by looking at this, this how do I know which database I am in? Okay, so I'm going to go down to a cheat sheet and I'll share that with you also. Let me go down to a cheat sheet and I'll share that with you. Just one sec. This is the in Edureka itself. Let me go down to week 6 yeah this document <coughs> whatever is needed I will of course uh, uh, point it for you guys don't worry look at <coughs> this command these are the two commands what I wanted you to see oops and I'll paste it in your document also so that we are clear the first command tells me how let me copy this into the chat window so that people are clear. So let me try this and I'm going to go down to my party and I'll put a semicolon and I'll press enter and do you see it is telling me which database I'm in. This is always a handy tool to let you know where you are. Okay? Cool?
So, and then what am I going to do is I haven't created a table. So, I hope you have got the transaction file in your uh, SDFS. So, how do I know if the transaction file is there or not? So, for you guys, in case if you are interested in the uh, complete uh, 1 million records, I can give you a link. Just give me one sec. Let me go down to the copy link. I have got a place where I have got the 1 million records, but what you have right now is you have got customer and the transaction 1.txt. So please put this transaction 1.txt file into HDFS. This file is having a limited amount of records. So let me open this and show it to you. This file has got only, let me scroll down. Wow. I, by mistake, I did a word wrap. So let me show you the number of line numbers that I have in this file. Just one sec. I don't know why is it formatting. A couple of seconds, you can see at the bottom that it's doing anyway. So let me scroll down and show you how many lines is there in this particular file. I only have got 50,000 records. Whereas in my real data set, I have got 1 million records. And I'm going to show you with 1 million records. So people would say, I also want to try with 1 million records. And let me show you where is that 1 million records file. Wait for a couple of seconds. Let me quickly show you the uh, 1 million records file. Just one sec. Come on, come on, come on. It should be there in your Hadoop additional. Let me see that. And that is the file. So right click and say share and I'll hit copy. Okay? So this is the link from where link to the 1 million record file, 1 million TXN record file, control. Sorry, I thought I copied it. Let me go back. That's funny. Control C. Let me ensure that is the right one. Control V. <coughs> let me see if it shows you that. Yeah, it shows you that. Perfect. So let me paste it over here for you, control V, okay? And let me put this into the chat window also if you want to try that. There we go, okay? I put it for you guys. Let me copy my link folder, copy link. Okay, now let me minimize. So I already have this in my HDFS. Okay, do we have anything like uh, SQL developer or DB visualizer where it will auto suggest or auto complete hive commands? Uh, you have something called as Hue that is called as Hadoop user experience. So you will have to use Hue. So Hue would be something uh, which will give you that auto complete kind of a thing. Okay. It is a layer that is above this. Remember I told you about Hue when I was showing you the drop down and all that? Cool Kirti. So now let me go ahead and show it to you. So if I want to run a uh, Hadoop command here, I can do an exclamation and then say HDFS DFS minus LS slash semicolon. I wanted to check if my uh, file is already there in my HDFS. And see, I already have the file. It is an 88 MB file, and it is uh, of type uh, uh, 1 million records. So I wanted to create the table now. So I'm going to do a shortcut, and I'm going to go down to uh, the create table. I've already said use retail, I mean use Kirti. So look at the syntax of create table. So whenever you create a table, <coughs> since the data has already come, so I'm going to create a schema around the data of the transaction table that is already there. I know there are nine columns in the table. So my create table syntax will have those nine columns. 
Then I'm saying that uh, how do I identify a record as with row format delimited, columns are terminated by a uh, comma, and it is stored in the form of a text file. You can store it in the form of a binary file also. So that's the reason why I'm saying that it is stored in the form of a text file. Okay, so I'm just going to copy this. I'm going to put it for you in your uh, questions window so that you have that. And by the way, you already have it uh, ready in your uh, document, what I've shared with you. And when I press enter, you see that the table gets created. Okay, now, where can I see the folder? Of course, it will be there inside my browser, inside my kirti.db. So let that page come. There we go. And when I click kirti.db, I see a new folder called as TX and records already there. So this is the table. Okay. So if I wanted to know more details about this table, see there is a command what I have already put for you that is called as describe formatted the table name. The table name. Okay. So I would say describe formatted TX and records. Okay. So let me show that to you. I would say describe format, uh, formatted TX and records. This will give me the details of the table. See, it will give you the detailed table information. Okay. Before that, it will give you the uh, columns that you are having. So I have got nine columns over here. The data type of the columns are shown. It will show you what is the database, who is the owner, when it was created, what is the production mode, what is the location of this. See over here. Then what is the type of table? So there are two types of table. There is an internal table and an external table. So I'm showing you manage table means it's an internal table. Then it will show you what are the various input format, output format, whether it is compressed, no, nothing. So this is the metadata that it is giving out, out of the table. Okay. Now I will have to load my data because my data is in my uh, Linux. Okay. Uh, hey, uh, just once again, the data is actually in my Linux. So I, I showed you the data in my HDFS, but actually the data is in my Linux. So let me actually show that to you. So for internal table, uh, I don't uh, have the data in HDFS. It will be there in my Linux. So let me simply go down to my places. And if I go down to my home folder, let me go down to my home folder, and you see the file over here. This is what is the file. So if I go down to my terminal window and just do a ls space minus all, it will show you that I have got this file over here. OK? So if you wanted to uh, confirm that this is the file that I'm using and not the file in HDFS, it would be, I can also do that. Guys, Linux guys, what is the uh, command for renaming? Renaming a file? Suddenly I'm blank. That's the reason I'm asking, guys. MV. No, MV is for move. <coughs> okay, good, good. Ananda said, no, CP is for copy. R-E-N, Ananda. That is rename. MV is for renaming. Okay, okay, MV. Okay, so, okay, fine, cool. So, funny, I was blank. Okay, MV is for moving and renaming. Okay, okay, cool. Thank you. So Arvind said they use MV for that. Okay, suddenly I was blank. So that's correct, Kirti. The data types are similar to Java. That's correct. So let me let me do that. I just want to show you that I am actually uh, using this file. Okay, so that you don't get confused. I'm going to call it as txns underscore one. Okay, so I'm going to say MV txns to txns underscore one. Okay. Or if TXN is 1 should be enough. And now if I do LS space minus all. Hey, thank you guys. Silly on my part. I thought MV is for moving. Suddenly I was blank. Okay. So I have got the file called as TXNS1. Okay. So I am just going to point it to a file. Hey, Malikarjun said table in a DB is just a pointer or a D reference to an HDFS file. That's correct. Beautiful. But right now, am I having a file in my HDFS Malikarjun? So you might, uh, let me go back to the browser. Where is my browser? So if I go down to my TX and records, I don't have anything inside that, right? 
So right now it is only pointing to a folder. Now I have to load my data. So how do I load my data? See here, in step number D you are seeing how to load the data into the table from the Linux client and not HDFS. Okay? I have given it very clear so that it will be clear for you. This is the way. So I am going to call it as TXNS1. And what am I doing? Load data local. Local means your uh, Linux. This is the path. Override means it will delete the contents of that particular folder. Okay? <clears throat> and then into table. So guys, can you let me know for this 88 MB file, how much time is it going to uh, go ahead and uh, uh, for, uh, load it, guys? Control C and uh, let me press enter. So you can see how it is going to load the data. Your Edureka VM will take a little bit more time, but then in a normal, I have got an Ubuntu VM, which would hardly take it in about two seconds. Okay? See, it took about 13 seconds for loading that uh, 1 million record. So now if I go to the browser and see, if I say go, you will see that I have got a file called as txns1. Got it, guys? So this is the file that I have, txns1, which is mapped to a table called as txn records. Okay? And now tell me, guys, if I do a select count, select count asterisk from txn records, how much time it should take for me to uh, work with uh, 1 MB file, uh, sorry, 100, uh, 1 million records. Let me minimize this. And just for you uh, other sake, you can see that it starts with a map radius. <coughs> okay? It starts with a map radius. And tell me, guys, how much time do you think it is going to take to do a select count? No, no, it wouldn't take five seconds. No, it will take a little bit more time because as the data becomes big, then you will see the performance. It will take ideally about uh, 33 seconds in a normal VM. But since Edureka VM is a little bit more heavy with a lot of components, etc., it will take anywhere between 35 to 50 seconds. That is for one million. Okay, then I will show you 10 million. You can actually try till 100 million. I have tried till 150 million on a uh, my own server of uh, uh, Ubuntu, and you will see that it it takes never takes more than seven minutes. 150 million on a 3.5 gig of RAM will never take more than seven minutes. Exactly, Praveen. So for select start from table, it would be select count. Oops, I, I said select count, right? Did I say select star? No, I did select count. Good. You confused me, Praveen. Select star is only going to be a file dump. Okay? Select uh, count asterisk is what will start with a map reduce job. Hey, Madhu was asking, can't Hive load the data from HDFS? And in fact, that's what it is doing. Where is the data, Madhu Prasad? It is there in HDFS. See over here. It is there in user high warehouse. Don't get confused, my dear friends. The actual data is in HDFS only. Okay? So it is actually loading the data from there. And see, it took about 79 seconds because it's purely because of the fact that this is a, a little bit heavy VM. So actual map reduce time was only 10 seconds. See here? The actual map reduce was only 10 seconds, but then the startup and the sh uh, stop time was high. So see, you see the answer coming over here as 1 million records. No, Madhu Prasad, I did a minus copy from local, so I have already moved the data to HDFS, Madhu. Okay? I cannot have map reduce if it was in Linux. Got it? Make sense? Good. So Hive DB is just Metastore. Yes, it's a database. Krishna was asking, name node is for Hadoop, what Metastore is for Hive? Exactly, Krishna. So I hope you are clear on this with this demo, guys, as to what all am I doing. So now what am I going to do is I'm just going to do a... Uh, 10 million records. So now to show you parallelism, will 10 million take 790 seconds or it will be lesser than that, friends? <coughs> Mani said, in our case, our file is split at MR level. How do we see it? It will get split into the folder structure. So whenever you put 86 MB file, 
<coughs> right now it will be only one file because 86 MB is less than 128, right? So if you had a file of more than 128 MB, then it would be there. No, no, it it wouldn't be uh, a, again 79 seconds. Okay, it would be more than that, but then it will definitely not be 790, right? Vijay was saying one minute 13 seconds, 10 million 130 seconds. No, 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 Vijay. It will not be that. You'll actually see it. So this is what a lot of people would think. Because it's a single node and I have got parallelism, it will be faster. Let me show that to you. So what am I doing? I am remove the word append, uh, sorry, override. And I'm putting it. So this is 2 million that I have put it. Just one sec. After I finish with this, let me do up arrow. This is 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. I've just pressed the commands so that this will automatically happen, okay? Don't worry. <coughs> now, once it's there, I will just go ahead and go. <coughs> so it'll take some time. See, 3 million is already copied. When I click on go, I should see 4 million getting copied. Let's wait for a couple of seconds. See, 4 million copied. So I have just run the command at the back of it so that it will uh, go it for 9 million. Then we will see. So that was a demo so that you will get an understanding and you have to try with all the examples what we have also, folks. So let's continue with the theory part of it. So let's move on. So if you look at the Hive components what we have, we have got a shell like what I showed it to you. You have got a Metastore that is nothing but the uh, Derby Metastore. You have got a driver who will take care of sessions, etc. You have got a compiler who will compile the SQL queries into MapReduce and the execution engine will actually run those uh, SQL queries. So if you look at the Metastore that we are having, there are three types of Metastore that we have. So when we talk about Metastore, there are uh, different ways how you can use it. By default, a embedded Metastore will be using Derby. A local Metastore can use a MySQL also. And you, you can also have a remote Metastore where it is there in a separate location. OK, cool. So that is the way how uh, this would work. Got it, guys? This is just to show you how you can have multiple Metastores. If there are multiple users connecting it, you will have multiple Metastores. Let me go back and check. See, 10 million, it took about 177 seconds, whereas for CPU, it took about 60 seconds. Earlier, it took me about 10 seconds for 1 million. So for 10 million, it took out only about 60 seconds. Will this query be fine enough for you, getting the category sum of amount uh, 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 based on category? Got it? So let me fire this query on a 10 million record. Oops. Sorry. Of course, it will give an error because it doesn't understand that. Control C. Control V. OK? On a 10 million record, think how much time will RDBMS take and we are seeing. I'm getting the category, sum of the amount, and I'm grouping by category. OK, friend? So I'm really doing a expensive work over here, and we'll see how it works. Mani said, how is the Metastore GVM different from the Metastore in the slide and outside the gray box? Hey, that is the type of doing it, friend. Here, we are there. It, we are having it as a local Metastore. That means it is there in the same location. Here, people are coming in from different locations, and that's why the Metastore is uh, in a remote location. See the difference between local and remote, friend. This is actually taken off in the definitive guide. OK? Cool. Let's continue. So having said all the benefits of uh, Hive, uh, let's see what are the limitations. One, Hive is not designed for OLTP. It is not designed for online transaction processing. It does not offer real-time queries and row-level updates. OK, Yusuf, I just answered that. It provides optimal, acceptable, not optimal latency for interactive browsing. Yes, but as compared to the traditional systems, it's pretty quick. And for small queries, it is very high. So if you talk about three records, it will still take uh, about uh, 20 seconds, whereas RDBMS will get three records in, a, in, in, a, in boom. 
Okay, in about one or two seconds, you'll get it. So as the data becomes big, that is the place where all of the Hadoop components would be more viable to use. So what all are the capabilities of your Hive language? You will be able to filter rows using a where class. You will be able to do equi joins between multiple tables. All types of joins are supported, left join, right join, everything. Ability to store the results of a query in a DFS is also supported. We will see all of these things today and in advanced edge base uh, also. So please walk around with these exercises, especially this document called as practicals.txt. You will have to try all these things. If you scroll down and see, see guys, we have got more than uh, 320 lines of queries for you to practice. So please try all of these things. This is going to be very important for you guys. And this is already shared with you. Okay? So practicing is something that you'll have to do. You will have to look at the assignments from the uh, module in the LMS also. Okay? You can create tables and partitions. And you can store the results of a query into another table also. So all of these things are what is your capability. Okay? Let me go down to the next slide. So if you try to compare the differences of Hive with the traditional uh, RDBMS, in RDBMS you have got schema on write, whereas over here it's schema on read. So see over here, Hive does not verify the data when it is loaded, but it does it only when the query is issued. And schema on read makes for a very fast initial load because the data does not have to be read, parsed, and serialized to disk in the database's internal format. The load operation is a file copy or a move friend. Okay? So please understand that. And like I said earlier, there is no updates. There is no concept of transactions. And indexes, like the way how you understand an RDBMS is not there, although there are something, we do have something called as create index, but then the functionality is a little bit different over here in Hive. So now, if you look at the different data types that we have, we have got integral types, we have got string types, we have got floating point types, and of course you have got uh, Boolean types. So uh, from the type perspective, this is quite mature. Of course you have got date time, you have got all of the types that is uh, uh, required. Plus, in addition to the simple types, you, you do have complex types also. So you will have something like a struct. So it is like a normal collection of attributes in an object. That's what is a struct. You will have maps, which is nothing but key value tuples. And of course, you will have arrays, which is indexable list. So all these uh, programming constructs are available in Hive also. So now, if you look at the data models, what we have in Hive, you will have a database. You know what is a database. You will have a table. Inside a database would be a table. You can also partition your data based on some column. Why do we do partitioning? So that you can have faster access to your data, right? So that's the reason why we will do partitioning of your data. And we have got something new called as bucketing or clustering. Okay, remember I said you can use Hive for data mining also. So what does partitioning do? Partitioning further divides it uh, into buckets based on some other column. And bucketing is primarily for sampling. We will, of course, see some examples of it. Let me go back and check. See here? In uh, 284 seconds, it fetched the 15 rows. And CPU time was about 780 milliseconds. Okay, 70, 780 seconds is for 10 million records. So we need, uh, frankly, look at a 10 million record in an RDBMS, not we need vinyl. Okay, in a 10 million record in RDBMS, do you think it will be done in about uh, 780 seconds? Or let's say, including the uh, job and all that, uh, 284 uh, seconds would mean 73, uh, 4.5 minutes. Think about it, guys. 10 million doing a group by class. Do you think it is going to be possible? No, no. It, it is really going to be. And, and look at the memory also. What kind of a memory what you're having in the system and what kind of a memory we are having over here? So that's why it is important. OK? Cool. <clears throat> so now let's move on. So when we talk about partitioning, OK, what is partitioning? 
like a normal RDBMS server will definitely know. So partitioning, we do it. We break up the table into smaller uh, coarse grain parts based on the value of a partition column. So what is the partition column that we are having is date, so that it makes faster to do queries on a slices of data. So let me give you a simple example of it. Just give me one sec about what is partitioning. So let me go ahead and uh, copy this into our day7.txt and let me remove this. Okay, let me do a word wrap. So this is the example that I have. Assume I've got a table called as customer which is having 1000 rows. I have got a column uh, uh, that is, uh, uh, let me change this. Okay, there we go. Let me change this permanently because a couple of these things are over here. So I don't want to get any of the things to be understood. Let me save this. Cool. Let me go back. So I have got a table called as customer, which is having 1,000 rows. Okay. Now I fire the query. Okay. Uh, the, what is the query that I'm firing? Select star from customer where region is equal to APJ. Okay. So uh, oh, the region is nothing but uh, one of the values of the columns. So tell me, guys what will be there when I do this. When I do select star from customer where region is equal to APJ, okay, will there be what kind of a job will be fired? Will there be a job fired or will there be no job fired? And if yes, will there be a map or will there be reduced both? So the question here is, I've got a table called as thousand rows and uh, there's a region column and I do select star from table name and uh, where region is equal to APJ, what would happen? Okay, so will there be any reducer that will be there? No, because I'm not doing any aggregation. So there will be a job and it will do only a mapper job because I, I wanted to find out the where clause, right? So in the mapper, I have to do an if condition internally to find out. So there will be a mapper which will just filter the rows. So there will be a mapper job that will be there. Let's say I fire select star from customer limit 10. So let me say I fire this query. Sorry, control Z. Let me fire this query. Select star from customer limit 10. Will there be a, a map reduce job or will there be no map reduce job? semicolon. What will happen over here, guys? Good, Praveen. Hey, Manish was saying but mapper will be needed across different file blocks. No, limit 10 will automatically, it is nothing but a file. Yes, there will be multiple blocks, but there will be no job. Trust me. See over here, guys. Let me show it to you. I will say select star from TXN records limit 10. Enter, boom, you got the answer. See, guys, it is like a normal RDBMS uh, command. So there is going to be no map reduce that will be there. If I say select star from top, yeah, it is like dumping the first end records. That's it. Yes, so there will be no job. Nothing will be there, friends. Okay, which is no job because it has to just dump the first end records from the file, right? So it knows where the file is and it will just simply dump the records. Make sense? So that is what it is. Okay. So uh, in the where clause, why did it not do reduce is what Yusuf was asking. The reason it did not do reduce in the where clause is because what was the aggregation? It was only select star, right? So there was no aggregation. That's why there was only a mapper and there was no reducer. Make sense? So the mapper of the things will come only when you are doing some aggregation. So in this example, when I fire a query, whether there will be a job created, yes, <coughs> but there will be, yes, there will be a mapper job created. Now what do I do? I partition the table. When I partition the table, what will happen? It will break up into the number of unique values, right? Okay. 
Akul Malikarjan. So, hey, Manish was saying, was this query fetching data across nodes? No, it was just getting it from one file, Manish. That's why there is no map reduce. Hey, uh, Krishna was asking, what decides whether a job is needed or not? We know no reduce if there is no aggregation. If you do a file dump, Krishna, select star from, then there is no uh, map reduce, but then if you, there is no mapper. But if the mapper requires some where clause, or if you select some of the columns, there will be map reduce. Got it, uh, Krishna? So whenever you are, uh, okay, good, good, Krishna. Fantastic. Manish was asking, then then why we have a mapper? You have a mapper because you want to select uh, something from the data set, right? So in the mapper logic, you will get the whole record. And uh, if you wanted to select only some specific columns, then you have a mapper, Krishna. Sorry, Manish. Only when you have got uh, to select something or where there is a where clause, will a mapper be involved, Manish. Try out multiple examples and you can see it for yourself, friend. Okay, cool. So we understood what is partitioning, so we are going to stop over here. So partitioning means you will partition data, you will decide where, which is the most commonly where, uh, where class is used on those classes you will create partitioning and people typically create partitioning on dates for convenience. The next dimension that we have in your hive is something called as buckets. Okay, so what is bucketing? Bucketing will give you an extra structure to the data that can be used for better queries. So that is one aspect of bucketing. So whenever you join two tables that is bucketed on the same column is typically done as a map side join. So you might be wondering what is this map side join? Today we are going to see that there is a map side and a reduce side join in your advanced map reduce. And the primary purpose of bucketing is whenever you do bucketing, you can evaluate a user-based query by running it on a randomized sample of total set of users. So the primary purpose of bucketing is sampling. So let me just explain that concept to you with a further example. So how is it bucketed? The way how it is bucketed is based on the hash function of the column on which you are bucketing. So let me explain that to you, okay? So let me go back to my example, and <clears throat> let's take the same example. I have got a table with uh, a 1,000 rows, <clears throat> and I'm not going to do partitioning. Partitioning is already done. It has got a column called as product, okay? And uh, let me scroll down. This is what is the meaning of bucketing. Control C and let me do Control V. So the use case is the same. I have got a table uh, in which I am. Uh, this is the use case. Let me put in a divider so that it will be clear as to what we are doing. Let me put in another divider over here so that it is again clear as to what we are doing. <coughs> cool. So the table has got thousand rows. There is a column that is called as product. Okay, and for the purpose of understanding sake, I have got 30 unique values of the product in the table. So now the question comes, when I do bucketing, how is this 1,000 rows spread across the number of buckets that I uh, create later on? Okay, so what is uh, bucketing or sampling? Sampling or bucketing means it would need to take the data from the original source and uh, <coughs> regroup it for something else. Right, so that is what is called as uh, bucketing. So we have to give the number of buckets at the table creation time. So that is what is crucial. Whenever you create a bucket, Okay, or whenever you are doing bucketing, you will have to specify the number of buckets that you are creating. So the thumb rule is, thumb rule of bucketing is create 15, then create 10, and then create 5 buckets to understand how the data is. This is the, what is the thumb rule of bucketing. Okay, <coughs> create 5 buckets. And why am I doing bucketing? <coughs> why bucketing? Why bucketing? Bucketing is done so that <coughs> we understand the data. It is also called as data mining. 
Okay. Why do I do partitioning? Because I do partitioning because I wanted to do performance. I hope it is very clear to you guys. Why do I do partitioning? Because partitioning is based on bucketing. Oh, sorry, partitioning is based on performance, and bucketing is ideally based on uh, the uh, uh, way how you want to create samples and how do you want to analyze it. <clears throat> yes, you start with a higher number and then you go down to a lower number. That's correct, Manish. That is what the rule is. So let me put this on uh, paper here. Why partitioning? Fast. Uh, this is primarily, primarily, primarily for uh, performance sake. Faster access to data. Okay. Whereas bucketing is to understand the data. It's a concept called as data mining. Okay. So <coughs> we saw why, why why do we need bucketing because we want to understand the data. I I'm going to talk about data mining. So let's take an example. So like I said, 1,000 rows, I have got uh, 30 unique values. So <clears throat> I am going to bucket my data. So what is the formula? Before even I talk about bucketing, what is the formula? The formula for bucketing is the hash of the bucketed column, whatever column you're bucketing it, mod the number of buckets. That will determine which bucket a row will go. That will determine which bucket a row will go. Okay, that is uh, what is the purpose of bucketing, guys. Okay, guys, clear on this? So this is what the formula is: hash of the bucketed column model uh, mod the number of buckets which bucket a row will go. So now let's take the example. So I have got thousand rows, thirty unique product values, and the customer is going to be bucketed on the product column the table customer and I have got 15 buckets. Now tell me guys how many buckets will be created? I have got the uh, statistics that you have to look at is customer table, 1000 rows, 30 unique values and I have got 15 buckets. How many buckets will be created folks? Okay, because I said I want 15 buckets, I would need 15 buckets to be created. The end result is it will get 15 buckets. Okay. You already said there are 15 buckets, so I'm asking because a lot of people try to co uh, correlate between the buckets and the values and all that. So I just wanted to be clear. So you will get 15 buckets, okay? Then will all the value of a product, one product, be there in one bucket? I've got 30 unique values. So will all the values of one bucket be there in one product be there in one bucket? This is the answer, guys. Of course, all the values of one product will go into one bucket because all of them will have the same hash. And when you mod the number of buckets, the remainder will be the same. And that is the reason why all the values will go into one product. For all the people who said no, why, friends? This is the basic difference. Will all the values of one product be in one bucket? Yes, a big yes. Will one bucket have more than one product? Or will a bucket not have more than one product? Of course, one bucket can have more. Uh, Vijay was saying, is there a capacity on the bucket? No, my dear friend. The formula is there. Okay? No, in most of the... See, how is that... See, you don't know what the data is. You want to mine the data, right? So you would you wanted to bring together similar things together. So what would happen here is the the mod will return you some remainders, and those remainders are all going to be based on whatever is uh, uh, the mod of the value. So let's assume uh, between values ten, okay, between let's say uh, the values of uh, one to ten, okay, I'm having one to ten. Okay, I've got 10 product values and I'm going, to, I'm going to have 3 buckets. So the value of 1 to 10 should be distributed in those 3 buckets, right? So when I do a mod, it will do the remainder. So you will definitely have the value of 3, 6 and 9 all having remainder 0 to go down to 1 bucket, right? Make sense? Cool? <coughs> So getting it, so as an example, between I have got values between 1 to 10, I have got three buckets. So what will it will be? It will be hash of the value mod 3 
which will determine the value. So if you say 1 mod 3, okay, it will give you some value 0, 2 mod 3, 2, sorry, 1 mod 3 will give you the value of 2, 2 mod 3, I'm giving you an example so that it will be very clear to you, 1, 3 mod 3 will give you the value of 0, okay, then 4 mod 3, 4 mod 3 will give you the value of, just one sec, just trying to be precise, <coughs> 4 mod 3 will give you the value of, uh, uh, again, 1, okay, sorry, uh, 4 mod 3 will give you 1, this should be 1, this should be 2, 2, no, no, this should be 1 mod 3 will be 2, this will be 2 mod 3 will be, what is the remainder of 2 mod 3? Okay, so decide how the value is going to be. 1 mod 3 would be 1, 2 mod 3 would be 2, 3 mod 3, then 4 mod 3 again 1. So then again you say 5 mod 3, 5 mod 3 will be 2. So saw how 2 and 5 will go down to the same bucket. Make sense? And dot, 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 so and so forth. That's what I'm trying to give you an understanding about so that it will be clear to you guys. Okay? One is a value here. One, two, three are values and it goes on. So at any point of time, you will have the values of 0, 1 and 2 and that is the bucket numbers. Make sense? So this is the way how the value would be put in. Am I clear on this guys? I hope there is no problem with communication. In the product table, one on the column on which you are going to mod this. So what is the formula? If you look at the customer table, I am having, so I am talking about the product. The product will have a value, right? Since I am going to mod it on the product, if there are 30 unique products, all the similar values will go down to one bucket. Can a product have more than one bucket? Yes. Okay, that means one product, uh, uh, one bucket can have more than one product like I showed it to you right now. Okay, can you have a bucket with no product? Maybe. So depending upon what is the hash value, uh, what you are having friends. So this is what the crux is. Okay, this is the way how the distribution of the data happens. Exactly, it depends upon the algorithm. Okay, no product can have more than one bucket but vice versa. Exactly, so a product can never be there in more than one bucket. That's correct, that's it. So in case of two different, uh, 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 there's no collusion over here. In case of two products falling into the same bucket, would it need to a collusion? Absolutely not. I want to do data mining. If two things are going to one product, that means I, I'm, I want to try to analyze that. I have got a hypothesis and I want to try that hypothesis on a particular bucket. So I will come to know how the data distribution is going to be. Make sense? In, in partitioning, you will definitely have one partition having a one value, whereas in bucketing, one bucket can have multiple products. Okay? So that is what is the concept of bucketing, folks. So now, <clears throat> let's apply that and see how it works. Okay? So if you go back to your uh, example, so that is practicals.txt. So, see over here, I'm again giving you the example for 10 customers, how does it look? First of all, you will have to create a partition table, okay? You have to create a separate table which will have that. So, please remember the partition table cannot have the partition column. So, I am going to partition it on category so that that number of columns what you see, you will not see category over here. Then I am going to say clustered by. Clustered by is a syntax for bucketing. I am going to partitioning it on category. I am going to do bucketing on state and I am going to have 10 buckets. And I, uh, the other three things are similar. Row format delimited, fields terminated by and stored as text file. Okay. Let me copy this and I am going to create this. So inside KT I am creating a table called as transaction records by category. If I go to the browser now. Let me go to the browser, come on one sec, Edureka, and let me go to the parent directory. See, I got a folder called as transaction records by category getting created. Let me have a look at the questions. Uh, Vineet was saying, can you explain that again? Sure, Vineet. I am going to do the partitioning on category. 
that means you will see separate folders coming and I'm going to cluster it on state that means clustering is bucketing it on state okay cool buckets will be files buckets will be file category is one of the column here you created a table before right so friends you will have to look at what is the table that we have created we created a table which is having a category so please have a look at the data set once the TXNS data set so that you'll understand it exactly we need I'm going to have partitioning and bucketing inside every uh, partition I am going to have multiple buckets here that's what I'm doing here <coughs> okay cool so now I have to set some parameters to make this work first bucket uh, partitioning is going to be dynamic so that's the reason I have to set this value you'll also have to set the partition mode as non-strict because it is dynamic bucketing is not enabled I am enabling it these are all the uh, queries or the property values that we are having okay <coughs> hey, first try with 10 buckets you can try with uh, 15 buckets also uh, Manish in your RDBMS by default it is static partitioning dynamic partitioning means whenever a unique value is come it will create a bucket by itself okay cool it is a setting for that particular table that's correct okay Praveen was asking non strict there is a difference between strict and non strict strict means it will know what is the value that is going to come non strict means I am flexible on the uniqueness of the value now since it is going to be dynamic that's the reason I'm saying it as non strict okay guys so there is what you can do is that once you do this see the output and then you can actually try to do it on multiple things also okay so see how I have set all the values now <coughs> I will have to load the data because the data is in my transaction so this is the way how you load it so from TXN records TXN you'll have to actually do it yourself guys I'm giving a demo only okay so you are saying from TXN records TXN insert overwrite table TXN RECS by cat so I'm loading the data from my transactions into my transaction records by category hey one most important thing I have got 10 million records it will take a lot of time so I want to make it as 1 million give me one sec I will just copy this once again so that it will become 1 million right friends because earlier it was 10 million right so let me quickly run this when I do override you know what happens it will delete the existing rows and it will make it as 1 million <coughs> go to the browser and see it is 1 million see here if I go back here the earlier the number of files was uh, nine ten files now it is only one file okay cool <clears throat> now let me load my data let me scroll down and let me fire the query and after firing the query we will see how it works I'm going to do control C and let me run this so on 1 million records it's trying to do it so it will set up all the values let it do the job let it finish after that I'll show it to you okay cool guys so now let's go back to the presentation we understood what is bucketing we understood what is partitioning please read the hive chapter in the definitive guide that will make the concepts even more clearer <clears throat> cool so now if you go down to the next slide we are creating a database we have already done this we have said use retail we have already done this friends let me go to the next page you are creating a table called as TXN records we have already done this right you have already seen that we have executed all of these commands <coughs> cool Madhu was asking those settings you need before partitioning right exactly before I do the actual partitioning I need to set the property so that it will do partition based on those properties that I have set so two properties are for partitioning one is for bucketing <clears throat> because by default bucketing is not enabled I have to enable it so now there is something called as an external table I'll cover it once I finish my this example use case I will go ahead and show that uh, external table to you so for the time being let's skip this particular slide we'll go ahead I'll cover it for you then what am I doing I'm loading my data into the transaction records we have already done this okay you see here there is one file over here we have we have already seen that I have already made 10 million records and shown it to you I'll describe my transaction records that is also done right then I am going to do select count asterisk from transaction records 
Okay, see over here for a small data set, it took me about 21 seconds. That is for 50,000 uh, rows. For 1 million rows, you saw it took only about 73 seconds. You can do some distinct also. You can, this is the query that I fired, right? Select category, sum of amount, because Vinil wanted to see what will happen if the queries, you have got a group by, if you have got a sum, you have got some aggregation, how it works. You saw how this works. <clears throat> so now, you can even output the contents of a particular query into a directory. So there are two ways. Either I can fire the result of a query that is select star from TX and records into another table called as results or you, I can even uh, fire this query that is select star from TX and records into a directory that is called as results. I'll actually demo that and show it to you. So see over here, this is the way how you are inserting the output into a local file, local file in your, local means in your Linux. Look at the word local. If I remove the word local, it will be stored in my HDFS. So let me actually go back and see where we are. See, fantastic, it's done. So let me scroll up a little bit. See what it is doing, guys, and let me highlight it and show it to you. <coughs> See how it is loading the partition. See, it would have created folders for all of these partitions. And then for every partition, see how it is creating buckets. You saw how 10 buckets are created. Okay, so now if I go to the browser and show it to you, you will be seeing that. Let me go back to my transaction records by category. See how it created a separate folder. Just give me one sec. There it comes. It created a separate folder for every category. And now if I say over here, okay, select star from TXN RECS by cat where category is equal to single quotes, puzzles, okay? semicolon. Do you think there will be a map reduce that will be fired here or no? Fantastic. You will not see a map reduce getting fired here. See over here. And see that it is a simple file dump. It has retrieved 12,000 rows in one go. Exactly. See, got it guys? Yusuf, let me go back to the browser and show you the partitioning. There it is. Yusuf Ashing, can you show the partitioning? See here, 15 folders got created because there were 15 unique category values. Okay? And inside every folder, you will have 10 buckets, okay? So for the air sports category, if I click on the air sports category, it will show you 10 files and those are 10 buckets that is there inside it, friends, okay? So this is the way how you'll be doing partitioning and bucketing. I wanted you to try this on your own, guys. Right now I did a demo. I understood it. I know it. But I want you to be comfortable with it, folks. So please try everything that is there in practicals.txt file. So now I'm going to show you how to redirect the output. So let's say I wanted to select some of the columns and I wanted it to be created in my Linux. So that's what I'm going to do over here. So let me copy this. Control C. Of course, I will make changes in this. Okay. Insert override local directory. And I am going to say single quote slash home slash edureka slash results one because I think results is already there. And instead of saying select star, I will only say select a TXN <coughs> transaction number, comma, category from transaction records. Got it? So this is how you do ETL. I am selecting some of the queries and I am firing it uh, into another file. Let me press enter. See, there is no reduce job because this is only a select query. It is launching job one of one and you will see how it fires. Krishna was saying partition uh, creates physical group of records, not just logical grouping. Exactly, Krishna. Partitioning is folders and bucketing is files. Partitioning was based on category, bucketing was on state. Exactly, Yusuf. 
So I fired that query. Let me go ahead and see if it is finished. Yeah, in 52 seconds it has done it. So now if I go back to my local file system and if I do my ls over here, I should see a file called as results1. See? So let me just say cat or uh, top, top or bottom. I think top, let's say results1. Sorry, what is the syntax for uh, getting the uh, top 10 records, guys? I'm blank. Suddenly, I'm blank, guys. So I want to get the top 10 records from a head. Thank you. Sorry, thanks, Praveen. <laughs> head 10. Suddenly, I don't know why I was saying top. Head uh, results one. Results one. Whoops. Hey, results one is a folder. Silly. CD <coughs> results one. Oops. I said results, cd, results1, and if I do a ls, there will be one file, I will say head, and uh, minus 10, and I will give the name of the file here, oops, 0, and let me press tab, okay, see over here guys, <coughs> how it has given me the transaction number and only the category, got it? So we understood what those outputs. Let me go ahead. I still will have to show you the internal, external. I'll, I'll do that. Let me first finish up with the slides. Then I will do that. So if you wanted to have a look at all the Hive commands, there is a fantastic blog that we have. So if you look at this blog, it will show you all of the Hive commands that is there with small, small examples. So it is always going to be very good to try out with small examples, guys. Okay. So try with the Hive commands. Now, you can even write everything into a script, into one script. So Hive scripts are used to execute a set of Hive commands. This helps in reducing the time and effort invested in writing the script. So starting from 10, Hive supports scripting. So you can say uh, uh, MySQL, uh, MyQueries.SQL Hive script. There is a file that is there. And if you wanted to run it, you can run it directly also. So how to run it is what I'm showing here. See over here, you will see Hive space minus minus F for file name and MySQL queries.sql. So this is also there in the cloud, uh, sorry, in the copy link. So if you look at, in Edureka, there is a folder called as Hive. <coughs> okay, see here, there is a file called as MySQL Queries.Q file. I'm going to open that with uh, uh, Edit Plus. Let me open that. See over here, how we are adding some uh, jar files, creating a database called as HealthDB, and firing some queries. You can run all of these things in one go. Make sense, guys? So just letting you know that how to do this. Cool. So let's move on. Then we have got how to create your Hive script. We have got a blog. So please visit that blog so that it will be helpful. Okay, Diraj was asking what is the command to execute. Same way, friend, go outside Hive and then simply say Hive space minus F. That's for the file name. And you will be giving the name of the uh, SQL file or the Q file. Okay? That is the syntax. Okay, Dheeraj? Cool. So this is the Hive script blog. You can have a look at this. <coughs> like I said, it supports almost everything in RDBMS. So now we are going to talk about joining tables. So I have got a user table. Okay, there are uh, three IDs. I have got a transaction table which has got the user ID also. Okay, and of course it has got a product ID. You see that uh, how the users have bought the different products. So if I want to join this table, so each of them have got uh, a product one. Okay, and only the user three have got uh, a product three. So this is the way how if you join the data, this is how you will be able to look at the product and the location. So product one was bought by three people and product two was bought by only one person. So this is how you can do a standard join in your data set folks. <clears throat> so somebody was asking me about Dheeraj, I think so about UDF, user defined function. So this is the way how you do it. Okay, so uh, let me see if there's an example. Yeah, hey, it is coming. 
So, uh, remember in our map reduce, I showed you a UDF as to how to uh, encrypt the uh, user data. So, we are going to revisit the use case in the healthcare domain wherein you are going to load the data into HDFS, uh, read data from the Hive table, de-identify columns, whatever is not needed, and store it back into a Hive table, which will store it into HDFS. So imagine if you wanted to do it in Hive, whatever is that step that we have done earlier. So what do you do? First, you create a package called as MyUDF, which will contain the UDF. Okay, so this is nothing but the business logic function that we are having. So let me go ahead and show it to you in the document itself. So see here, this is what is deidentify.java. So see how you are creating a package called as myUDF. Of course, you are importing something. Then you are, uh, uh, your function will by default uh, extend the UDF function. And then you are, have to override a method called as evaluate where you write your business logic. See, there is an evaluate with one string, there is an evaluate with uh, a text and a string, and then there is a function called as encrypt, which I will be using it in my code. See over here. So this is a UDF which will have business logic method. So your business logic method is there in encrypt, and you are using it in my evaluate and in my same evaluate with different parameters. Okay? So then what do you do? You will add it to the jar file. So once you create a jar file, you will add the jar <coughs> to, so that it will go down to the location. So you would see here it, it added it to the class path. Now you will create the healthcare sample table loading the healthcare sample dataset one, <coughs> dataset one dot CSV into the table. Okay, first you create the table, then you load the data. Like what we did right now, create our transaction record and load it. You already have this data sets with you folks. Okay? <clears throat> then you will create a temporary function called as deidentify. So this deidentify function is what I'll be using it in my code. Okay, in my Hive script. So what is this deidentify going to point to? My UDFs.deidentify class is what it will do. And then look over here how it is actually fire. You are actually using the deidentify function. So once you create a Java code, the UDF, once you create a jar file with the UDF, you can uh, add a function and then reuse it in your code. So please try this out, guys. What I'm showing you, how to create your function, please try this out. And then you are storing the output to a local directory. Okay? So after I de-identify, I'm storing it to a local directory. So see here, same thing what I showed you last time, insert override local. That means your Linux, uh, whatever is the path of it, select star from so and so. That de-identified record. Okay, and uh, this is how you can store the output to HDFS in the out directory. One, I was showing you how to do it in the local file system. Another, I'm showing how to do it in the HDFS, guys. Okay, and this is where the output will be. You will see the output coming in the form of encrypted data. Okay, see over here, all of this thing is encrypted data. That means uh, uh, I'm using the encrypt function and it is getting encrypted. Okay, folks? So this is the way how you will be using the UDF and doing it in the healthcare example. Hey, Dilaj was asking, where is the function used? Let me go back. See, friend, what did I do? I created another table called as a healthcare sample DS, de-identified table, and I'm applying my UDF on all the attributes. So that is the table that I'm using, Dilaj. Okay? Sure, see here, Amadu, I've actually made the call of UDF here. See, I created a function called as day identifier, right? And see over here, what am I doing? Uh, create table so and so as select from patient ID, de identify the, this one, see here, de identify weight once again. Sorry, guys. This one, see what I just highlighted right now? So I'm using that function actually in my syntax. So we have got this UDF, and you see the final output that came up. Let me go back to the question section to see if Yusuf is clear on that. Fantastic. Let's move on.
<coughs> so now the assignments, please refer to the documents present in the LMS for your assignment. You are going to calculate a stocks covariance assignment. Please try that out. Go through the map side join versus normal join that we have in the block. Uh, also look at the healthcare use case, what I just showed you right now. Okay. In the next session, we will actually see how to do joins more. I've actually shown you dynamic partitioning. Okay. How to use custom map reduce scripts and high view DA. We already done that, but then we'll quickly cover that up. And we will talk about edge base, your edge base storage architecture and cluster deployment. So these are the things that we will be doing it in our next to next Saturday class. And these are the things what you have in your LMS. You will have the stock variance data set. You will have the Hive healthcare data set values. Okay. And the Hive commands and the quiz. Please ensure that you catch up with everything, guys. That's very, very important. Let's talk about internal versus external table. Give me one sec. So let me open up this document and just give me one sec. Come on. It should come with open with. Let me open it up with Explorer. So we are going to talk about internal and external table. Until now, what have you seen? You have seen a internal table because you haven't seen the word external, right? You have seen only the internal table. So today, let me explain to you about the internal table. That should be good enough. Okay, I'm just increasing the font of this. So this, of course, I'll be putting it into the questions window, then you can check it out. Okay, so first point, uh, uh, there are six differences between internal and external table. What do you mean by an internal table is a table that is created without the external word. So by default, it is all internal tables. So when will I create an external table? If the data is already present in HDFS, one of you asked me earlier also, if the data is already present in HDFS, why should I load it again, right? Because the data is already there. So in such cases, we will create something called as an external table, okay? So the location of the data for the internal table would be uh, in user hive warehouse, whereas the location for external table will be in a different location in HDFS. Then, do I need a load for my internal table? Yes, because the data is not in HDFS. So that's the reason I have to say load. And what will load internally do? Load will internally do minus copy from local. Whereas for an external table, I don't have to say load because the data is already present in HDFS. And at the time when I create a table, I will actually point to that particular table. Okay? Good. So you will see that. Let me finish this thing so that you'll understand everything. So no load is required at the time when I do with an external table because you'll already specify the table name at the time of creating the table. So the third point is what are the syntax? Of course, normal create table, visavis create external table. So for external tables, you'll have something called as an external word. Now, who has got control over the data files? Since it is inside the warehouse directory, Hive has got control over it, whereas HDFS will have control over the data that is there for the external table. So the biggest difference between internal and external is that what will happen when I drop a table? Okay, when I drop a table for internal table, you will see that both the data and the schema goes away. Because why? Because you did load, the data got loaded inside the warehouse directory. So when you drop a table, even the data will get deleted, like what happens in RDBMS. Whereas, if the data is there in some other location in HDFS, not inside user high warehouse, and when you drop a table, only the schema is dropped the data is not deleted at all. Because in the real world, the data will be used by multiple applications. It will be used, so you can you can use it for analyzing via PEG. You might have uh, been using it to analyze data via Hive. So that is the difference. So only the schema is dropped. So what is the purpose? When will I use an internal table? If you want to do some temp analysis of data which is not present in HDFS, you will use an internal table. Whereas if the data is already present in HDFS, HDFS, you will not use an internal table. You'll always use an external table. Okay? Make sense?
So this is the way how it is used. So Dheeraj was asking, can we use uh, UDF while queuing external tables? Yes, why not? Definitely yes. So Dheeraj said, yeah, it is the same as Oracle external table. That's correct, Dheeraj. Okay. Where do you create external table? If the, like I told you, if the data is already present in HDFS, as if you'll create external table. How is it implemented in external table in Java? Hey, it's like a normal table, friend. Only thing is that when you create a table, you will give a syntax of it. Okay? Cool? Yusuf said, when I move data from HDFS to Hive, it exists as both levels with three-level replication. Friend, when, I mo when you did a load, you moved it from Linux to HDFS. So please understand, you will never have two copies of the same data ever in my HDFS. Okay? Cool? <clears throat> I can load my data into internal from external? Yes, why not? You can definitely do that, Nandesh. Okay? So, please remember yourself, you will never have redundancy. Okay? When I move data, you never move data from HDFS to Hive. You move data from your Linux to Hive. That's why minus copy from local was used, yourself. Okay? So, how do we make it work? This is the three syntaxes that is there. So first, you will create a folder in HDFS called as Hive table. Why Hive table? Because if you look at the document, uh, uh, let me scroll up. I've given an example over here that is called as Hive table. Okay, just once again, let me remove this. Okay, so this is the syntax for Hive table. Look at the syntax. I am saying create external. So that is new. So instead of internal, for table external TX and records, blah, blah, blah. Store as text file and you give a location. So at the time when you're creating a table, you have to give a location. Okay? So this is what is the syntax of your external table. Let me put this into your document so that it will become clear. Okay? <laughs> the comparison between internal and external table is over here. Let me copy all of these things and keep it for you. And this is the hands-on that you will have to do, guys. Okay? So what are we doing? First, create a folder in HDFS called as Hive table. Okay, why? Because uh, uh, a table is mapped to a folder, right? So first I'm creating a folder. So you might be wondering, I already have got TXNS inside my uh, warehouse uh, directory, right? But that is, since we are doing an example, so that's the reason why we are duplicating the data. In a real world, you serve, the data will never get duplicated. Okay? Then you do a FS minus copy. So for us, it is not input. For you, it is TXNS. Okay, it is not even TXNS, it is TXNS1 that I gave you right now. You will move the data from TXNS into the Hive table because in the root there are multiple files, right? They are not of the same structure. So that is the reason why I am moving it to a Hive table. Then you will create the external table as per the syntax. What is the syntax? The syntax is available for you over here as to how to create a table. Okay, then uh, you would say select count asterisk from TX and records. So the performance of both internal and external table will exactly be the same because both of them are analyzing from HDFS. There will be no difference at all. Okay? So CP is nothing but uh, uh, copying the file from one location to another location. Okay? Nandish was asking, how does partition work in external table? Hey, the partitioned table can never be external. If you are having a partition table, anyway for partitioning you will create one more table, right? So that table will always be internal table. So if you ask me, can partitioning be done on external table? Yes. Partitioning can be done on external table, but then the partitioned table can never be external. And then please try dropping the external table and see if the table will be present. And yes, the table will be present by default. Okay? So with that, we are finished with uh, today's session, guys.